Good morning. I'm Gotti Schwartz in for Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. Escalation breaking this morning. More explosions in Ukraine. Ukrainian officials report an attack on critical infrastructure in the western city of Lviv less than one day after a wave of Russian missile strikes across the country. Now international leaders condemning Russia for what it calls retaliation for an explosion that damaged a key bridge in Crimea. Russia has proven once again that it is a terrorist state that must be deterred in the strongest possible ways. Plus, new concerns after North Korea simulates a nuclear attack meant to wipe out South Korean and U.S. targets will bring you the latest. Bad omen this morning. Worry on Wall Street and beyond over comments made by a top banking CEO. Why the head of J.P. Morgan says several signs are pointing to a recession in America. Plus, what that could mean for your bottom line. On the agenda, the Supreme Court back in session and set to take on several high-profile cases this week. We'll break down some of the trials to watch that could have widespread implications. And a count locked this morning. Kanye West facing the fallout over anti-Semitic posts on social media. More on the rapper's controversial comments, plus the backlash that's now spread to his business partnerships. We're happy to have you with us on this Tuesday morning. Happy you're back yeah. again. Yay. Happy it's to be been back. so much fun having you here in New York. We begin our show this morning with two major foreign policy challenges for President Biden. The war in Ukraine and North Korea's worrying new missile tests. Yeah, Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, is still on edge one day after Russia carried out a series of strikes on that city and many others in response to Saturday's Crimea bridge expo explosion. Officials say 19 people died across Ukraine and more than 100 were left injured. This morning, people in Kyiv took shelter again after air raid sirens rang out through the city. Over in uh, Zaporizhia, explosions were heard throughout the night. One person was killed, according to the regional governor, after missiles hit public buildings. President Biden condemned yesterday's uh, attack, quote, uh, in a phone call with President Zelensky, Biden vowed to continue supporting Ukraine by providing it with advanced air defense systems. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry has the very latest from Kyiv. Good morning, guys. This is a city that is weary, a city that is tired, that once again had air raid sirens throughout a night and is surveying the damage. We're here at a playground to show you the impact crater that one of these rockets left. You can see how destructive each of these individual strikes were, and there were dozens of strikes throughout the day. The death toll currently across the country, more than 19 people dead, more than 100 wounded. And you can see so many of these targets were just civilians' targets, a children's playground. This this playground is a miracle that nobody was killed because this park was bustling at 8.15 in the morning rush hour. And the attacks, as I said, are not over. Officials are stressing that they are worried Russia could carry out another wave of strikes. We've already seen that this morning in the city of Zaporizhia. A dozen rockets landing in one wave, killing one person, but again hitting infrastructure targets, which is what we're seeing in the western part of the country as well, in the city of Lviv, taking a second round of strikes this morning. We're told the power is still out in that city. Savannah, Gotti. Cal, stay safe out there. Thanks so much for that. And now to the latest from North Korea, which is making provocative new comments, saying, saying its recent string of tests were designed to simulate a nuclear strike meant to wipe out South Korean and American targets. We have full team coverage of this latest escalation with NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley in Seoul, South Korea, and NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Good morning to the both of you, Matt. I will start with you. So North Korea has conducted seven missile tests now in recent weeks, including simulated use of its tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. What do we know about those weapons and why is this happening right now? Yeah, Savannah, it's an interesting question. Uh, it's not just those seven tests in just the last two weeks. That's a really high tempo of testing. Uh, it's actually been more than 40 since the beginning of the year, which is unprecedented. We haven't seen that ever. So this year has seen a really big ramp up in the testing of all of the missile systems that North Korea has available. And, you know, a lot of these are showing off new technology. You know, hearing from people who watch North Korea, they say there's no reason necessarily to not believe what the North Koreans' explanation is, which is that they have the tech and they're trying to test to see if it works. But at the same time, they're also trying to demonstrate to the world that they have this capability, because up until now, we know that the North Koreans had nuclear capabilities. They tested those decades ago, so they have that. They also have 
ballistic missile capability. In, in certain places, they have uh, long-range ballistic missile capability. But what they haven't been able to show is that they can marry the two, that they can deliver a nuclear payload on a ballistic missile and that it would be effective in reaching places like Seoul, where I am now, or U.S. military assets, military bases in this city or elsewhere on uh, the peninsula, and the places like Guam, even the United, continental United States. So this is a demonstration to show that not only are they able to detonate a nuclear weapon, but that they're able to reach out mm. and use that nuclear weapon in combat. Now, they're also ramping up this technology and doing all of these tests in such a rapid pace because the pace of U.S. and North and South Korean and Japanese military exercises have also been increasing this year. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that President Donald Trump is no longer in office and we're getting back to a footing uh, under Joe Biden where uh, there is more cooperation between the United States and allies here in Northeast Asia. So, in many ways, it is the United States and its allies here in this part of the world that is motivating the North Korean response. Savannah? So, Matt, what is South Korea saying about this? I mean, just earlier this year, a new conservative government was inaugurated in Seoul. How are they responding? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, Savannah. And for better or for worse, um, you know, the, the actual government that's in office in South Korea here doesn't necessarily have the same amount of traction uh, that the government in Washington does. So whether there's a conservative government or a liberal government here in Seoul, it really is all about who is in power in Washington, whether it's Donald Trump or whether it's Joe Biden. And the government here, they're responding the way other successive governments in the past have responded. They're condemning these, these uh, tests and saying that nuclear weapons are not necessary and should not be used. And that is the kind of language that you would hear from any government. But Kim Jong-un has made it clear time and time again that he doesn't even necessarily want to speak to the government here in Seoul. He wants to speak to whoever's in power in Washington. He considers Seoul to be entirely beholden to the government in the United States. And whether he's wrong or whether he's right, that means that it is Washington that sets the tone and the tempo of the diplomacy mm -hmm. that happens here on the Korean Peninsula. Mike, Savannah? that's a perfect way to bring you in here. So what is the White House's response here? Well, to Matt's point, while the North Koreans may want to deal solely with the United States, the United States' response has always been, and is in this case, to emphasize the unanimity of our alliances in the region. The United States ramping up its contacts, the president speaking just in the last week, and the vice president as well with the prime minister of Japan and the president of South Korea. The White House has always emphasized that all these conversations are happening in tandem, in, tri in triad, you could say, with these three nations. But there's another point worth considering here, and this is as the White House is monitoring this very closely, a meeting that the president is likely going to have in, in the next month. The president, uh, in the past, we've seen that China is often a useful interlocutor here in trying to manage these tensions between uh, the United States and its allies in the region, as well as North Korea. Now, President Biden is expected to meet in person for the first time next month with China's president, Xi Jinping, during a summit in Indonesia. That conversation, obviously, is going to cover a range of subjects, but the increased tensions in North Korea are likely to be uh, rising to the top of the list. Absolutely. Like also, though, North Korea, of course, isn't our only international concern right now. Ukrainian President Zelensky actually tweeted that he spoke with President Biden yesterday following these renewed Russian attacks we've seen in Ukraine and on the capital city of Kiev. Do we know what was said during that call and what the White House is saying about this new line of attack from Russia? Yeah, this is actually the second conversation between these two leaders in about a week, uh, an indication of the extreme concern within the White House. You and I talked last week about the president's closed-door comments at the fundraiser mm -hmm. about this as well. The White House saying that the president continued to uh, pledge to continue providing Ukraine with support it needs to defend itself, including advanced air systems, and also to provide security, economic, and humanitarian assistance. Uh, in just about an hour, Savannah, President Biden will be taking part in a uh, emergency meeting of the G7 leaders to talk about the urgent response here. And the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is also flying to Brussels uh, for a meeting with G7 defense ministers, where this is going to be at the top of the agenda, of course, the rising concern here as there is concern that, well, for the discussions about President Putin looking for an off-ramp, he's not interested in one. Absolutely. Concerns, as you mentioned, that he expressed of a nuclear Armageddon. And look at the conversation we're having this morning. Mike Memoli and Matt Bradley, thank you both so much for your reporting.
Now to Washington and the latest on the search of Mar-a-Lago. The Justice Department is set to respond by today to former President Trump's request to vacate a ruling from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Trump filed the emergency motion to the Supreme Court last week, just hours after the appeals court allowed the DOJ to resume its review of the documents seized in the FBI raid of Mar-a-Lago. Let's bring in NBC News analyst uh, and former federal prosecutor Glenn uh, Kirshner. Glenn, good morning. First, let, let's go back a little bit here. Uh, what What's Trump's legal team arguing and why do they want to reverse uh, the appeals court ruling? You know, Trump's legal team has been trying to argue that a former president should enjoy some sort of special status in the law. So he should be entitled to, for example, a special master, an independent third party to review everything that the FBI seized from him pursuant to a lawfully issued, uh, a judicially issued search warrant. And, you know, most people, I think, are of the mind that, well, the law should treat everybody the same, should treat everybody equally. So why should a former president get this special treatment, have a, an independent third party review everything? But, you know, I would hasten to add that the law actually doesn't treat everybody the same. When federal prosecutors, when the FBI searches a, an attorney's office, well, that attorney will typically get a special master appointed to review all the materials that have been seized for potential attorney-client privilege. I could see um, the, the appellate courts wrestling with this unprecedented set of facts, the search of a former president's home, and say, you know what, we're going to put a former president in the category of an attorney. We're going to say we're going to build some extra safeguards into the system and let this special master review run its course. So, you know, we're all closely watching what the 11th Circuit will do. And then, of course, uh, the outlier is uh, Donald Trump's defense team has already filed an emergency appeal with uh, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, who has supervisory responsibility over the 11th Circuit. So there are a lot of moving legal pieces in this one. Now, Glenn, when it comes to prosecutors, what, what options are available to the DOJ when responding to Trump's request? What, what are you expecting to see uh, from the federal prosecutors? Oh, I expect they're going to hold the line. They're going to say, listen, we, we acquired this evidence lawfully pursuant to a judicially issued search warrant. And they're probably going to argue that the president is but a mere mortal and the DOJ should be allowed to go about its business in a timely manner of conducting a criminal investigation of documents that, let's call it what it was, were stolen by the president from the executive branch, from the government, and were seized and returned to the government. And now DOJ needs to do a, a prompt and thorough investigation to see where criminal liability might lie. And what's next for the DOJ investigation once this legal battle is, is passed? Well, I have to believe they are dug in to these documents. They're probably uh, subpoenaing grand jury witnesses to testify about the, the documents, whether they were shared, whether they were compromised, whether they were leveraged. And, you know, Donald Trump just sort of infamously said at one of his rallies, they're my documents and I want them back. And, you know, that is not only pretty telling, it is also potentially an admission that could be used in a future prosecution if one is brought against Donald Trump. Glenn Kirshner, thanks so much. Now to your morning news now. Weather it looks like a pretty big cold front is headed our way. We've got uh, meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Yeah, she's in the studio, do. right? I know. She's right here in the studio. we got some showers in the middle of the country, right? What's happening? We have some showers, some storms. By the way, I feel like I, I'm like a family reunion. You guys look so similar. Like, I know. No, right? We, we're, we're, we're debating on yeah. who's going to lose the glasses because there yeah. are one set it. of glasses too many on this <laughs> desk. Right. I love we'll it. Both no. not know what's going You're on. both adorable. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's talk about the storms because we are looking. Well, let's start with freeze warnings because it is so cold in so many spots. We're looking at frost advisories, freeze warnings. We're starting out with temperatures in the 30s in a lot of spots. So upstate New York into New Hampshire, Vermont, also Maine, looking at that chilly start. We're looking at temperatures 30s, 40s, 51 degrees right now in New York City. It's going to warm this afternoon once that sun really gets going. But as we look towards the west in the plains, we are so above normal for this time of year, 15 to 20 degrees above normal. It's this big area of high pressure. It's 
bundling in this warm air, also some humidity. So it's hot, it's humid in some spots, and it feels like August in a lot of spots. So temperatures for the highs today, 15 to 25 degrees above what is average for this time of year. That is in the red, and this is what's ahead of the cold front. Once that cold front moves through, it's going to knock down the temperatures, and we're going to see a big difference over the next several days. But again, it's feeling like August in some spots in mid-October. What does that look like? It looks like 85 degrees in Omaha today, 19 degrees above normal for this time of year. Minneapolis, 81, Wichita, 84. We're warm also in Green Bay, just 75, but that's 14 degrees above normal for this time of year. Then this warmth is going to move off to the east. So there's that cold front back here. Here's the warm air. We're looking at 90s in Dallas, also in Houston tomorrow, 91 in Dallas. That's 12 degrees above normal for this time of year, 69 in Buffalo, 71 in Boston. Then we'll keep it warm on Thursday in Portion of the mid-Atlantic. We're looking at temperatures right around 71 on Thursday. We drop it down because that cold front's going to move through the Northeast. That's going to bring the chance for showers and storms. So 66 on Friday, 64 on Saturday. Feeling nice and crisp. It was a great weekend last weekend. We're going to do another one once again this weekend. We have those mild highs. We have the chance for strong to severe storms. I'll get in that in just a second. Much cooler temperatures in the Pacific Northwest. We were warm yesterday. There's that cold front. It's a strong one. It's going to bring the chance for strong wind gusts. It could be damaging. Some lightning, also some hail. We could see some rain and snow mixing into the Rockies, also the high plains. Ooh. Tomorrow, there's that cold front. You can see the storms kind of blossoming along that cold front from Texas all the way to Michigan. So again, the threat would be damaging winds, some heavy rain, some lightning. And then the Northeast, you're going to have a wet day. It's going to be windy, too, kind of a damp day on Thursday, so plan some indoor activities. We could see a lot of rain, too, generally two to four inches, the most falling in portions of New England. Mentioning the severe threat today, uh, it's for anywhere from Oklahoma into portions of the Great Lakes, so Minneapolis, Des Moines, Kansas City, into Wichita. We're looking at winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail, low chance for a tornado, but it is not zero. And then tomorrow we're looking at that area expanding. So now we're talking the Southern Plains, the Tennessee Valley, into the Ohio Valley. Once again, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Hail could see uh, some really heavy rain as well. Generally two to four inches. Notice those brighter colors. That's where we're expecting the heaviest rain. So portions of Pennsylvania into New York. I love that you're so into this. <laughs> also, New England, you're really leaning into this. So you need the umbrella on Thursday. I love it. Back, let's get to some economic news and the growing fears of a potential recession. The CEO of America's largest bank now says he believes the U.S. and global economy are indeed heading down that road and fast. Joining us for more on this is CNBC reporter and anchor Juliana Tattlebaum. Juliana, good morning. Thanks for joining us. So we've been talking about these comments from him. This was your interview. You spoke one on one with the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, where he warned of that warned of that looming recession. Tell us more about your conversation and what specifically Dimon is concerned about here. Savannah, good morning, and thank you for having me. This was a wide-ranging conversation, but I kicked off by asking the J.P. Morgan chief what he was seeing in the U.S. economy and what the outlook is for the United States. And he essentially said it's not what he's seeing right now that worries him. It's the future, in particular rising interest rates and the war in Ukraine. Take a listen to what he had to say. Right now, the U.S. economy is actually still doing well. Consumers have money. You know, fiscal stimulus, they still have more than they had before. They're spending 10 percent more than last year, 35 percent more than pre-COVID. Their balance sheets are in great shape. Yes, debt's gone up a little bit, but not nearly to pre-COVID levels. You can't talk about the economy without talking about the stuff in the future. And this is serious stuff, okay? This is inflation, which obviously is, you know, changing the effect of those numbers I just told you about. It's rates going up more than people expected already. Europe is already in a recession, and they're likely to put U.S. in some kind of recession six, nine months from now. So those were Jamie Dimon's comments around the economy. In terms of markets, I asked him where he sees the S&P 500 index hitting a bottom. And he responded, he doesn't know for sure, but he could see it dropping a further 20 percent. So warning mm. investors could see more pain to come when it comes to stocks. Absolutely. Juliana, if we do head into a recession, did Dimon say how severe he believes it could potentially be and what kind of impact that has on our economy then long term? Well, it's clear from his comments that it is not a matter of if, but a matter of when, when it comes to this recession. Um, listen to what he had to say about the potential severity. This is the thing no one ever really knows, right? You have a strong consumer going into it. 
businesses are in pretty good shape, but they were amazingly resilient during COVID. Now you have to look at the range of outcomes. It can go from you know very mild to quite hard, and and a lot will you know rely on what happened to this war. Mm -hmm. So I think you know to guess is hard. Be prepared. Well, as you heard there, two of the main things to watch, according to the J.P. Morgan chief, are interest rates and where the Federal Reserve goes from here, and something that is much more out of the hands of the Fed and officials in the U.S. is the war in Ukraine, with the um, tensions escalating in recent weeks, posing a major concern for the bank chief. Yeah, you mentioned those interest rates, the fact that the Fed's raised them several times. How does Diamond think the Fed is managing inflation? I mean, we've continued to see inflation. It really hasn't brought it down much. How does he feel about that? Well, this is perhaps the um, critical question here for investors across the globe. How confident are they that the Fed is going to be able to navigate through this period of uncertainty? And on that front, Jamie Dimon said that uh, the Fed deserves credit for how it handled the COVID pandemic and navigated through that period of uncertainty. But in, in terms of their more recent policy moves, Dimon said that the Fed waited too long to act. They did too little mm -hmm. with hindsight, and now they're clearly motivated to catch up. Um, depending on the scale of the recession, he could see the Federal Reserve having to cut interest rates next year. All right, Juliana, great interview, and thanks for joining us with it this morning. And now to the latest in the sentencing trial of convicted Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz. Closing arguments are set to begin today in the penalty phase against him. Yeah, this comes nearly a year after he pleaded guilty to 17 counts of murder and 17 counts of attempted murder in the deadly 2018 shootings in Parkland, Florida. The jury will begin deliberations tomorrow and will choose one of two possible sentences, life in prison or death. NBC News senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders joins us now from outside the Broward County Courthouse. Carrie, good to see you. So what are we expecting here to hear in these closing arguments today? Well, it has been an incredibly emotional mm -hmm. penalty phase with so many people testifying. But today what we will hear is the defense attorneys arguing to the 12-member jury here in Florida that Nicholas Cruz's life should be spared, that he should be sentenced to life in prison, that he had uh, a disadvantage from the moment he was born, born to a mother who was an addict, that he had had a very difficult childhood, and that he did not adjust to society. While the prosecution will argue, the state's attorney will say, if there was ever a heinous crime that deserves the death penalty, it is this. Guys? And Carrie, I mean, you got to think of the family that's yeah. in that courtroom. Ooh. This trial has to recreate so much trauma yeah. uh, of that horrific day for the victims and their families. What are they saying about Cruz's sentencing? Gotti, there was so much angst going into this trial in the penalty phase here. Some family members of the victims wanted a trial so that they could confront and say something directly to Nicholas Cruz, while others felt that they did not want to stomach this, did not want to relive this, that this has been so incredibly painful. Remember now, this was 2018 that this horror took place on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in Parkland, Florida, and now it's 2022. But those who did take the stand had powerful statements and powerful testimony. Here is some of it. Gina Rose Montalto, forever 14. Our daughter, Gina Rose Montalto, was a special girl who... I was so happy to be her father. She was beautiful and a gift from God as he chose to bless our family. My forever 14-year-old little boy... Alex Schachter, our family is broken. There is this constant emptiness. Our life has been shattered and changed forever. Joaquin, I love you, I miss you, and I will never forget that smile of yours. On February 14th, 2018, my heart stopped beating. Our fourth and youngest child, Elena Petty, was taken back home to live with our Heavenly Father. I'm still trying to learn to live with this every day. I will miss my son tomorrow. I will miss my son for the rest of my life. I now struggle every day with the reality that I didn't get to tell Jamie one last time that I love her. To try to articulate how it has affected me would be for me to rip my heart out 
and present it to you shattered in a million pieces. A heartache that will never be erased for the 17 families who lost loved ones and for the 17 attempted murder charges in this case. There needs to be a unanimous decision by the jury for death. If there is even just one juror who votes for life, then the gunman in this case, Nicholas Cruz, would face life in prison. Guys? Oh, Carrie Sanders, just such impactful statements there from those families. It just breaks your heart. Thank you so much, and we know you'll be watching. We'll check in. International headlines now. Central America is in recovery mode after getting hit by Hurricane Julia. Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with this and more. Good morning, Claudio. Hey there. Good morning, Gaddy. Good morning, Savannah. Well, at least 28 people were reported dead after Hurricane Julia, as you mentioned, uh, swept through Guatemala and El Salvador throughout the weekend. Now the hurricane has dissipated, but at least on Monday, it was still showering and drenching the two Central American countries with torrential rains. Five of the victims died after a hillside collapsed on their house, and nine others lost their lives while performing rescue work. Now let's move to China, where cities like Shanghai and Shenzhen have ramped up COVID-19 measures after infections rose at the highest rate since August. Local authorities have increased testing and closed schools, entertainment venues and tourist spots. Shanghai, the financial capital of China, said on Monday that it will conduct routine testing at least twice a week until November 10th. And let's stop by New Zealand, where the government has proposed taxing the greenhouse gases produced by farm animals when they burp and pee as part of a plan to tackle climate change. It's all true, I swear. It's not the first time that the tax collector plans on planning on showing up at the cow sheds in New Zealand. Back in 2003, a previous government proposed a tax on animal farts. Now the plan was scrapped after farmers, well, raised the stink about it. Now with the Supreme Court entering its second week of a packed new fall term. That's right. We know the justices will hear four cases this week before holding a conference uh, day on Friday to review the arguments. And these will be the last cases the justices hear until October 31st. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to break down uh, some of those cases. Now, uh, Danny, so let's start with this California law called Proposition 12, right? It's known as the Farm Animal Confinement Initiative. What does that mean? Basically, California enacted a law that provided for, that said if you're going to sell uncooked meat, uh, particularly pork products in California, then you have to prove that the pigs were raised humanely. But at the Supreme Court, that is really a side issue. This case really isn't about are pigs mm. cute, do they, do they deserve better lives. It's really about what's called the Dormant Commerce Clause. In other words, can individual states, and this came up way back in the time of the framers, can individual states engage uh, in prejudice and discrimination against other states, which back in the time of the revolution and hundreds of years ago, it kind of made sense. Delaware was suspicious of Pennsylvania, so they would <laughs> enact tariffs and said, don't bring your Pennsylvania corn in here. Uh, we want to be, we want to favor our own Delawarean farmers. So that is where the dormant commerce clause comes. Uh, states cannot discriminate against other states. But the argument here that California is making is that this rule doesn't discriminate against any state. If you, uh, if you raise pork in California, you're subject to the exact same rules as someone from Nebraska or anywhere else. Bottom line is if you can't comply with our humane raising of pork, then you just can't sell in California. You can sell in Canada, you can sell in Iowa, wherever you like. None of you can come here, including California pig farmers. So it's kind of a Supreme Court case about bacon. It is. It is, in a sense. <laughs> I it mean, is. you laughed at me. That was yes, my goal. It is. Okay, now let's turn to a case that's kind of this battle between copyright, fair use, potentially impacting the art world, has to do with Andy Warhol. Walk us through this one and what you think about it. Yeah. Art is in the eye of the beholder, and it's not only in the, our, the eye of us as beholders, but nine unelected justices on the Supreme Court. So every single time one of these cases on copyright law comes before the Supreme mm -hmm. Court, believe me, reasonable minds can differ. I would bet that the three of us would have wildly divergent views on this Andy Warhol case. And basically what happened was there was a photographer, <clears throat> Lynn Goldsmith, who took photographs of Prince, the late artist. 
Later on, Andy Warhol did what he does, and he took those uh, that work. And there you see some Andy Warhol work right there. It's very distinctive. Mm -hmm. And he took that Prince photograph, and he ran it through whatever, whatever color formatting he did. Mm -hmm. And he created what is now before the Supreme Court as either, is it a derivative work? Or if it is derivative, then it is Lynn Goldsmith's, and she's entitled to royalties anytime someone uses it. If it is transformative, if it is fair use, then it is no longer really the original work, and Lynn Goldsmith has no dispute. You see a lot of different of the, those prints there. You can see yeah. that what Warhol will do is essentially take a photograph and put uh, a color thing on it. Now, look. Here's how people will differ on this. Mm -hmm. Take me, for example. I don't get this Andy Warhol stuff. I can do what he did on my iPhone with a filter. I, so you're telling me that's transformative. I know, yeah. But by the way, you may completely disagree, and that's the beauty of it. Now you look at it, the Supreme Court justices are the same way. They may look at this work of Andy Warhol's and say, yeah, I don't get it, which really isn't the legal issue, but it will certainly inform mm. the way the justices decide. So many implications either way. Yeah, decide, and it's interesting right? because I I actually think his art is amazing, and I, I couldn't do it myself for sure. Uh, but it right is here, perfect. I have a filter. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. we'll get. You're going to get some tweets about that one. All right, go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and lastly, as we all go back to work, I mean, they're going to be hearing a lot of cases about going back to work and, mm. and the workplace. One of them has to do with a foreman, I believe, that's making 200 grand, and yet uh, is is also asking for and says he qualifies for overtime. What's the situation there? I love these overtime cases. I used to handle them, full disclosure. I, I have handled them in the past. But basically, what the argument is, is you have a worker here who was in an executive type position, supervisory position, made over $200,000 a year. But now the FLSA, which is the overtime law, which was designed for blue collar workers to protect them and give them overtime. What happened here <clears throat> is a loophole. And there are entire law, class action firms that sit around and hunt for these loopholes where they can make millions of dollars. And they seem to have possibly found one, depending on the, what the court does. Because this worker was paid at a daily rate as opposed to a salary, that is a different regulation, and he may be entitled to overtime, even if he did make over two hundred thousand so dollars. His daily a year. rate equaled two hundred grand, and then he's saying that he gets overtime on top of that. Well, yeah, well, yes, but uh, the, the the only reason he's before the court is that he was classified as a daily rate wow. worker. An unusual situation. Most people making over two hundred thousand dollars a year are not daily rate workers, but that may be just the oil industry, the way it works. And this little loophole here might entitle this worker uh, to who made over two hundred thousand, I think about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, to overtime. Now that's another interesting thing is how are they going to prove that? Because I guarantee he wasn't clocking in and out, right. uh, or if he was. I mean, you know, now you get into issues of when he was on his phone, being a supervisor, yeah. does that count? So really interesting case. Not really wide-reaching implications because I think this is a very narrow uh, set of facts here. Yeah. I'm going to be sitting around yeah. thinking about how people just sit around looking for loopholes. Danny Svalos, <laughs> Where's our overtime, by the way? It's 7 a.m. <laughs> thank you, Danny. <laughs> it's time now for our weekly mental health check-in. We all know winter's coming, and with the cold weather comes seasonal depression sometimes. Yeah, we've got some tips, though, to help you get through those darker months. Plus, new studies show COVID may have altered our personalities. We'll walk you through just how much people change in these last two years. Narelle Feliciano joins us now to break down these headlines for us. She's a psychotherapist and author of This Book Won't Make You Happy, Eight Keys to Finding <laughs> True Contentment. Love the title. Nero, good morning. Thanks for joining us. So let's start with that seasonal depression. What is it about these months that make people potentially feel worse? And also, of course, tell us what we can do to help ward off these winter blues. So generally, when the weather gets colder, we're limited in our desire to do certain things like connect socially, going outside, exercising in different ways in the better weather. And that can trigger some depression in people that starts around this time of year when the leaves start changing, when the temperatures get colder, when we have less daylight, and it can extend into early summer even. And it's very similar to other types of depression in that we want to withdraw and isolate, mood changes, um, our sleeping and eating patterns may change, but the big ones is the loss of joy in the things that we normally do enjoy. And there are many things that we can do to prepare 
for it going into the season. One is to think about what is difficult for you in this season. Most people who've experienced seasonal depression know what is difficult for them if they take a look at the last year. And now is a time while we have the motivation to make a plan to connect with other people, to be social, think about how you want to exercise as the season change, even connect with someone to exercise. Those two things in and of itself can help ward off some of the more severe symptoms of seasonal depression. And also, if it gets to a point where you just don't have motivation to do those things, um, contact a clinician to help you get through it. And Nero, I want to talk a little bit about that study uh, about how the COVID pandemic might have caused rapid personality shifts. I know when we went into the pandemic, I think I would have considered myself an extrovert. Yeah. When we came out of the pandemic, mm. I feel like an introvert. So it, people that are watching, if, if you might suspect that you lost some of that, that joy or the positive personality yeah. traits, how does somebody get those back? So I experienced the same thing, mm. having been more of an extrovert my whole life. So I understand this pretty well. And one of the reasons that we find, and this has affected younger people more so than adults who were still in that developing stage of their personality. Again, one is to recognize the areas that you've changed, whether it's this desire to connect with people or your desire to trust people or be social. And connection is a big piece of it. Talk with your friends, schedule time on the calendar to get together with other people. And connection in and of itself can bring back some of those feelings. The areas that we saw change are people's ability to trust other people, their social skills have changed, their ability to think creatively have changed. And all of that is due to stress and isolation that we experienced over the extended period of time during the pandemic. Nora Feliciano, we appreciate you talking through this with us. So important to talk about this stuff. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And Kanye West is under fire after a series of anti-Semitic posts on Instagram and Twitter. Both social media platforms have already suspended the rapper for violating their community guidelines, with a lot of celebrities now speaking out about the impact of his words. You don't love Ye, you love money bag, yo. Kanye West making headlines after posting alarming anti-Semitic statements on Instagram and Twitter. In the early hours of Sunday morning, the rap star lashing out, tweeting, I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I am going death con three on Jewish people. The funny thing is, I actually can't be anti-Semitic because black people are actually Jew. Also, you guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who ever opposes your agenda. His Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook accounts have all been suspended. The backlash immediate with several celebrities and organizations speaking out against his latest statements. Comedian Sarah Silverman tweeting, Kanye threatened the Jews yesterday on Twitter and it's not even trending. Why do mostly only Jews speak up against Jewish hate? The silence is so loud. The Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance also reacting. Ye's recent statements about the Jewish community are hurtful, offensive, and wrong. And actress Jamie Lee Curtis reacting to Kanye's statements, tweeting this, the holiest this day in Judaism was last week. Words matter. A threat to Jewish people ended once in a genocide. Your words hurt and incite violence. You are a father. Please stop. Curtis also blasting him in an interview with Hoda on the Today Show. I burst into tears. I woke up and burst into tears. DEFCON 3 on Jewish people? What are you doing? It's abhorrent behavior. I hope he gets help. I hope his children get mm -hmm. help from him. Mm -hmm. The press completely killed us. This weekend's uproar came on the heels of a controversial fashion show in Paris in which Ye debuted a line of T-shirts with the words White Lives Matter boldly printed across the back. He spoke to Fox's Tucker Carlson about the T-shirts. So you made reference to the White Lives Matter T-shirt, mm -hmm. which you brought out at... Paris Fashion Week. Yeah. Why, wh why did you do that and what did it mean? You know, people, they're looking for an explanation and people say, well, as an artist, you don't have to give an explanation, but as a leader, you do. Yes, I think that's right. So the answer to why I wrote White Lives Matter on a shirt is because they do. It's the obvious thing. Kanye also took shots at music mogul Sean Combs, known as Diddy, saying he is controlled by Jewish people, a reference to a long-standing anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. The White Lives Matter t-shirt, I don't rock with it. Don't wear the shirt. 
Don't buy the shirt. After terminating his clothing deal with Gap, Kanye also turned his ire to current business partner Adidas, making scathing remarks in recent weeks. The sports brand now reviewing their partnership and putting out this statement. After repeated efforts to privately resolve the situation, we have taken the decision to place the partnership under review. Kanye returned fire on Instagram. I am Adidas. Adidas raped and stole my designs. Today, he released a video on YouTube where he appears to show pornography to an Adidas executive. Yeah, come on. A friend of Kanye's repeats his claim that the company stole his designs. We reached out to Adidas for comment, but haven't heard back. Now, according to Twitter's policy, enforcement action can range from 12 hours to seven days, depending on the nature of the violation. Mm. And now to some financial news. The third largest railroad union might go on strike. Yes, yeah, CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other financial news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, guys, good morning. Yep, so the possibility of a major nationwide rail strike is back on the table after the industry's third largest union rejected a contract deal. More than half of workers who build and maintain tracks opposed the five-year contract, which offered a 24% raise and $5,000 bonus. The union says railroads didn't go far enough to address the lack of paid and sick time off and working conditions. Both sides will return to the bargaining table before a strike would happen. A walkout could potentially cripple the U.S. economy. Meta Platforms is holding an event today where it's expected to show off new products, including a high-end virtual and augmented reality set. CEO Mark Zuckerberg will give the keynote address. The event comes at a critical time for the parent, a company of Facebook and Instagram, which has seen its stock fall 60 percent this year. And shoppers could see major discounts this holiday season. Adobe Analytics says price cuts could be as much as a third or more, especially for gift items like electronics, toys, and computers. Adobe also expects consumers will see a drop in prices for televisions, appliances, clothes, and sporting goods. The majority of deals are expected to fall between Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday, guys. Well, Savannah, you're in luck because it's that time of year again already. Holiday Amazon. Time. Kicking off the holiday season a little earlier than usual with its Prime Early Access sale. Just think of it as uh, the sequel to Prime Day, right? Yeah, we're going to get into exactly what it means. <laughs> but starting today, thousands of items will be listed at a deep discount ahead of Black Friday, which is still about a month <laughs> and a half away. Oh, I like that. We have so much lead up to Christmas. Oh. Giving customers a chance to get a head start on their holiday shopping. Yeah, Trey Bodge joins us now to give us a scoop on how to snag the best deals. She's a smart shopping expert at TrueTrade.com. Trey, good morning. Uh, what should savvy shoppers be looking for this year on Amazon and, and where can we find those sweet deals? Sure. So Amazon has this two day sale, which is brand new, and it's the only the second time in one year that they've had a sale like this. And so this is so exciting. We're going to be seeing a lot of great deals, particularly on Amazon owned devices like Fire, Echo, anything in that landscape. And so you can expect to save between 50 to 80 percent off. And then other brands are having really exciting sales as well, like Sony, Bose. Um, and then and lots of toys too. So parents and other folks should definitely be looking at Amazon to see if they can check some holiday items off their list. So Trey, anybody who's got an Amazon account knows about Prime Day. What's the difference here between Prime Day and whatever this sale is? So it's very similar, actually. I would say that it's not as large as Prime Day. Mm. Obviously, Prime Day has been going for eight years, and this is the first time that Amazon's had a second sale. Uh, so obviously, this is exclusive to Prime members, but if you're not a Prime member, you can actually sign up for a free trial that's 30 days long, and you can check out the sales today. So I would say maybe fewer deals, but just as exciting discounts. Oh. That's right. Amazon is obviously the biggest kid on the block here, but they're not the only retailer that are starting this. When Amazon does something, usually trickles down everywhere. Uh, where else can people go for, for some savings right now? Where can we get a sale? Yeah, so Amazon's not the only one having a big sale today. Walmart is doing their rollbacks and more sale. Kohl's is having a big sale today. And then Groupon, if you're looking to give more experiential gifts, they have Groupon Day on Thursday. And I'm expecting to see lots of other retailers kind of jumping into the pool right now because it's a very exciting time. Um, according to Bread Financial, who I work with, they found that 55% of people will have started their holiday shopping by the end of the month. And 86% of those people will could be convinced to 
spend more if there are extra perks. And I think that's what retailers are banking on, that consumers are going to overspend a bit because we're looking at kind of a soft holiday shopping season otherwise. And so retailers are offering lots of incentives to excite those consumers. I'm just suspicious, though. Like, the deals have got to get better. I don't believe Target's Black Friday deals are as good <laughs> now as they will be I on Black Friday. I believe that 50 percent stat because 50 yeah. percent yes here, 50 yeah. percent yeah. no. Still, still <laughs> too soon. <laughs> Trey Bodge, yeah. thanks so much. Disagree. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's end the hour on an amazing rescue in the Gulf of Mexico that came just in time for three fishermen who were lost at sea and fighting off a group of sharks. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us now from Peak Keeg Biscayne with the details. Hey, Sam, good morning. Savannah Gotti, good morning. Sounds like three words you don't want to hear in the same sentence together. Shark infested waters. And yet, that is exactly how this played out. These boaters went at 10 o'clock in the morning, were supposed to return at sunset. When that didn't happen, one of their spouses contacted the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard then scours an area the size of Rhode Island with marginal chances for survival. They said somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, maybe with life vests on. But they were aided by one fateful clue. This morning, an unbelievable rescue in shark-infested waters. Three missing boaters saved in the Gulf of Mexico while fending off a swarm of sharks. They had multiple lacerations on their hand, um, almost down to the bone. The three fishermen had been floating in the water for 28 hours. That's clear the vessel. One man found drifting, hoisted in the air, assisted by a rescue swimmer. The other two, nearly half a mile away, clinging to a cooler as rescuers saw as many as four sharks circling nearby. The men set out from Venice, Louisiana Saturday morning, but never returned home. For hours, Coast Guard teams searched the massive area by air and sea. And then around noon Sunday, a miraculous stroke of luck. One of the men, somehow able to get cell phone service briefly, sending a rough Google Maps location. He told me he had 2% battery and uh, he, he fired off that text message. With no coordinates, the rescuers managing to track them down anyway. Using kind of geolocation and, and orienting ourselves to the map and some of the contours uh, from Google Maps of the Gulf of Mexico, we're able to, in the command center, uh, identify the location. Within two hours, the boaters were spotted some 25 miles offshore. We actually were able to recover one of the life jackets that had been eaten through by a shark. Two were bitten and all three exhausted and treated for hypothermia, but incredibly alive. It's difficult for us to describe how lucky they were that all these things happened in their favor. And guys, just to give you some more color on the conditions that these boaters were up against, it was rough waves, three to five feet. It just so happens that one of the Coast Guard choppers spots someone a thousand feet up in the water with a life vest on. That is what catalyzed this entire rescue. Marine experts say there's a higher number of sharks right now in the Gulf of Mexico than normal bull sharks and tiger sharks. They were punching them off, as you heard, <laughs> hands bitten down to the bone. And yet, they survived. Pretty amazing. Oh, I am. <laughs> There are so many details that I don't even know how to process what you just told us, Sam. Punching them in the I face. See but that, that's what you're coming. supposed to do. I see a movie I, coming. Yeah. I mean, an hour after hour after hour. Five foot waves? Of a life. Yikes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sam Brock. Wow. 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 Thank you for blowing our minds. <laughs> yeah. And that does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.